billion dollars into the two-month campaign of Lieutenant Governor Bill Halter against Senator Blanche Lincoln in Arkansas. Um, the, the link, the, basically, Halter ran by even with uh, Blanche Lincoln at that uh, time. And in the, in the primary last week, he may very well win on the runoff on June 8th. Uh, I think he's got a lousy chance for the general election. But the point is, the unions are going to keep pumping money in and keep trying to affect these results and buy votes. In particular, they're looking at the card check issue in that Arkansas race with Blanche Lincoln. Having said she was supportive when, it could, when they knew Bush would veto it, uh, decided that she wasn't going to back it when it actually would go into effect. She's, you know, sort of a politician. Um, Bill Halter says he's not taking a position on card check. I actually know Bill Halter. I've known him for about 20 years and had some professional relations with him, and I won't characterize him in any negative way except to say he reminds me of Richard Blumenthal. <laughs> The, uh, in any case, uh, I think that that's uh, uh, something that, uh, that's here. Uh, in one of my examiner columns, I made a comparison, uh, which perhaps some of you in the, uh, this room won't like, uh, between the Tea Party movement today, or perhaps a broader movement symbolized but not limited to the Tea Party, because there's a lot of people getting active in different ways that you may not even have heard of but have similar motivation to you. Uh, and the peace movement, the anti-war movement of the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, that also involved a lot of people who hadn't previously been involved in politics. It was initially bipartisan. The peace movement uh, ran Gene McCarthy against Lyndon Johnson in 68, Pete McCloskey against uh, Richard Nixon in 72. Ultimately, it gravitated primarily to one party, in their case, the Democrats. Um, but it had a lasting and important effect. Um, it caused some problems. Uh, you had left-wing candidates challenging moderate Democrats in the winning primaries and then losing general elections. You had party splits. You had the, uh, the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, which I attended, my first of 20 national conventions that I've attended. Uh, but the, uh, and without, you know, the one that it was beautiful weather, that was the good news about Chicago in 68. That's going to be pretty terrible. The, um, the, uh, but it had a continuing effect because a lot of good, solid citizens got involved, even if we don't agree with them at this point, and, and affected a political party for a long time. And I think that the movement of which you folks are part uh, has potentially a similar, uh, a similar potential effect today. I think that uh, you know some of you who've gotten involved uh, and weren't previously may you know, save you out of the movement a short time. Others, I think, will remain involved more, and some of you uh, will become the Carolyn Justices of the future. Um, and um, that, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, some of the fallout now from the, uh, after the victory of Rand Paul in Kentucky, who clearly had that support, beat a candidate of the party establishment. Uh, he's now got himself in a ruckus because he went on MSNBC for reasons unknown to me. And uh, he, uh, he, he expressed doubts about the wisdom or the constitutionality of part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which had not heretofore been a political issue this year. Um, those of us who've been in politics for a long time, our reaction to that is sort of <laughs> uh, on the other hand, that's the sort of thing what hap that happens when you've got new people involved. You have some problems, but you also have uh, a lot of potential. You have an injection of energy, you have an injection of enthusiasm, you have an injection of idealism of people who are in this, uh, not uh, simply to advance themselves, uh, but to have uh, made a real difference. Um, and I think uh, that dedication is going to be needed in the future. Uh, as one of the earlier speakers said, repeal of some of this legislation, uh, turning, rolling back the attempted Europeanization of the United States uh, is going to be difficult. Uh, we've got a health care bill um, that, uh, um, well, it reminds me of uh, the rural Texas sheriff that uh, 
talked about some guy who'd been rustling cattle. He said, that guy needs hanging. Uh, the the health care bill needs repeal. Um, the, uh, but we've got a whole system that's been put into effect uh, with the bailouts, with this financial services regulation that passed the Senate yesterday. Um, that, interestingly, Obama's portraying this that we're taking on Wall Street. If you read the annual report of Goldman Sachs, they're for this bill. The community bankers are against. You're beginning to see a picture there. Goldman Sachs also the number one contributor to the Democratic Party candidates in the 2008 cycle as employees. Right. The, the big competition was the University of California at Berkeley. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Uh, that's true. Uh, the stimulus package, as I mentioned, sends money to the unions uh, who get money back. We're seeing a whole system of bailout favoritism, of crummy capitalism, and what I called in the uh, pages of the uh, Washington Examiner, uh, gangster government. Uh, the Chicago style uh, breakdowns. You guys stop lobbying against this right now. You shut up or you're going to be in trouble. Uh, you know, uh, some of the uh, community banks have put, the basic response to some of the banks that have posted on this legislature was nice little bank you got there. Wouldn't want anything to happen to it. Um, this is the sort of uh, public policy uh, that we're seeing now. So, I think um, I am fascinated by the way in which we are seeing what we're seeing now. In a way, to put on my hat as an amateur uh, historian, uh, we're seeing an argument in our politics that's really like the argument between the founders of the late 18th century and the progressives of the early 20th century. Uh, the founders believed in ordered liberty the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A competent but limited government uh, responsible to, as the first words of the Constitution say, we the people. Uh, the progressives thought this was outmoded. They said that in an industrial age, when people work in big factories, um, this was horse and buggy government. The government needed to be run by centralized experts, people who had high graduate degrees that were the only people capable and sophisticated enough to understand uh, complex society, um, and that, uh, that they had to help, um, help otherwise helpless individuals who were swept under by big corporations and aggregations of capital. Um, the, the, the progressives have tried to foster a culture of dependence in which ordinary Americans are seen as incompetent and in need of protection and supervision by centralized experts. The founders believed in a culture of independence, a culture in which ordinary people can pursue happiness in a nation of limited government and guaranteed liberties, in which they can work in their communities to improve life generally and, uh, with those and help those in need uh, on their own and in the ways they want to. Um, and what's interesting to me is that the hundred-year-old vision of the progressives sounds kind of tinny and out of date now. It sounds a little antique, you know, big factories where, you know, dusty people are living in tenement buildings in New York, that kind of thing. Um, and that uh, uh, the 200-year-old vision of the founders rings true. It still sounds... That somewhat uh, old language, you read it, you listen to it, you try to understand it, you parse it, and it's like, it's like taking a silver spoon and hitting a crystal goblet. Uh, it rings true. Uh, and I think there's, uh, as a book author, I think there's a lesson here. Um, in the universities, you know, a lot of the um, universities are replacing scholars who specialize in the period of colonial America, the founders. And they were replacing them with people who were doing transgressive feminist dialectics or something like that, uh, because those are the old Quran kind of things. Some of the people, some of the replacements are okay. The reading public in America has been buying up and making bestsellers of books about people like Washington, 
Franklin, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison.